Good evening, everyone. Welcome to SFSQ. Welcome to our students and visitors. It is my utmost pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker in our ambassadorial series, Professor Dani uh, Ambassador Daniel Benjamin, who is a Norman uh, McLaw Junior Director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. Prior to joining the Dickey Center in 2012, uh, Ambassador Benjamin served again as ambassador at large uh, and coordinator of the co for counterterrorism at the Uni United States Department, State Department. In that position, he was the principal advisor to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton on counterterrorism. Ambassador Benjamin was the longest serving coordinator for that task since the, posi the position was created. Uh, and during his tenure, the office of the coordinator was elevated to become the Bureau of, of Counterterrorism. Uh, prior to joining the, Ob the Obama administration, good, nice going. <laughs> Obama administration, Benjamin was a senior fellow in foreign policy studies and director of the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution from 21 and 2006. He was a senior fellow at the Center for Stra Strategic and International Studies in Washington, and prior to that, he was a Jennings R Randolph Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace. During more than five years of the National Security Council staff in the 1990s, Benjamin served as foreign policy speechwriter and the special assistant to President Bill Clinton and as director for transnational threats. Benjamin has written, written extensively on terror, terrorism, US foreign policy and international affairs. He co-wrote The Age of Sacred Terror, which was awarded the Arthur Ross Prize of the Council of Foreign Relations, the largest American prize for a work on international affairs, and was named uh, a New York Times notable book and the Washington Post best book of 2002. The next attack, the failure of the war on terror and the strategy, a strategy for getting it right, was published in 2005, which he also co-authored, was named a best book of the year by the Washington Post and the Financial Times and the finalist for the Lionel Gelber Prize. He is the editor of two other books, Europe 2030 and America and the World in the Age of Terror, A New Landscape in International Relations. He has appeared on numerous television and radio programs, including 60 Minutes, Frontline, The News Hour, All Things Considered, Morning Edition, Fresh Air, The, new, the Today Show, Good Morning America, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and his essays have appeared in publications including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Financial Times, the International Herald Tribune, uh, the Times, Slade, the New York Review of Books, the New Republic, the Frankfurter uh, Zurich, and Die Zeit. Okay. Benjamin began his career as a journalist and held positions as Germany Bureau Chief, Bureau Chief for the Wall Street German and Germany Correspondent for Time Magazine. He holds degrees from Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar, and Harvard, where he completed his undergraduate work, graduating magna cum laude. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Benjamin. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that um, lengthy introduction. And um, uh, it's nice to hear all those things, although I must say it makes you feel very old. Either that or I can't hold the job for very long. Um, anyway, um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be back in Qatar. And um, I just want to say it's especially nice to be here uh, at this time of year. Uh, at home in Vermont right now, they are receiving a foot and a half of snow. And uh, we've had temperatures this winter of minus 30 Celsius. 
Uh, of course, on one of my earlier trips to Qatar in August of 2012, um, it was rather warm. And uh, I don't think I could see through my glasses the entire trip. So uh, let's uh, agree to visit each other. Um, I'll come in January, February, March. And you come to Dartmouth in the summer, and we'll have a grand time. Uh, I, w I do want to uh, just um, say uh, one word of uh, clarification. Uh, one of the uh, sort of absurd niceties of uh, serving as a with the rank of ambassador in, in the government, and I think this is true in most places, but it's certainly true in the US, is that they uh, let you call yourself ambassador after that. Um, I also go by professor or director and just plain old mister, but um, I am not part of the US government now. Um, and I was a political appointee, and, uh, and my service ended on the last day of uh, 2012. So uh, to any, uh, anyone, uh, one student put this to me already, how can you come and, and criticize your, your government. Uh, that, that's why. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, Georgetown Qatar for inviting me to speak here. Uh, Georgetown was, if you will, our, our home team for the 20 years uh, my family lived in Washington, DC. And uh, so it feels very familiar. I've, I've been here before and very comfortable to be here. And I particularly want to thank uh, Professor Abu Sharaf and Haga Raka for all their help in planning this visit. Uh, I particularly want to thank them for putting me in one of Doha's very lovely hotels, which uh, happens to be uh, completely filled with very fit and muscular people from FIFA right now. Um, many look like they are still playing competitive football. And it is a good, if not exactly welcome, reminder that you need to attend to the body as well as to the mind. Um, I've entitled my talk, Navigating the Storm, USGCC Relations in an Era of Disruption. And um, let me just say that uh, as a US diplomat, one of the things I really enjoyed about my job was traveling the world and explaining why the United States was doing what it was doing and what we stood for and how we stood ready to help others advance our common agenda. And uh, I'll confess at the outset that today's message is not so upbeat. And indeed, it gives me no pleasure to discuss many of the subjects uh, that I will address. And um, uh, it's quite a painful, uh, painful subject for me. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, our President Donald Trump has been characterized as, quote, a disruptor since the outset of the presidential campaign in 2015, and now is often called the disruptor in chief. Well, what does it mean to be a disruptor? It's clear that for Trump, this means someone who delights in overthrowing established understandings, norms, agreements, and pieties. It means someone who uh, cares little for uh, the things that have gone before. And I confess that when I think of President Trump as a disruptor, uh, what comes to mind is a verse from the Old Testament, uh, from the book of Genesis, uh, that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. And that quote is, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Um, this uh, sentence comes to mind, this verse comes to mind, because somehow it, it lodged in my memory as the first case of national disruption. And that's the translation from the King James Bible, by the way. And we know that uh, as um, the story progresses, things don't work out very well for Pharaoh. Well, Donald Trump um, can be said to know not Joseph in the sense that he does not know our history or the traditions of our governments. It is noteworthy that in um, almost 250 years uh, of American democratic experience, he is the first American president who has spent no time in government. <clears throat> he is skeptical of our traditional alliances uh, and our friends. Uh, and also sometimes our foes. Uh, and he certainly is skeptical or uh, unknowing of the reasons why uh, we consider our allies to be our allies and our foes to be our foes. He embraces, as has widely been noted, a transactional approach to foreign policy. Uh, that's a, another way of saying that he prefers to have discrete deals uh, that don't hinge on accumulated understandings of the 
uh, from the past or established relationships. The worldview behind this approach uh, is at odds with uh, US traditions. Uh, but it was set out, I think, pretty forthrightly in an essay in the Wall Street Journal by White House economic advisor Gary Cohen and national security advisor H.R. McMaster when they wrote, the president embarked on his first foreign trip, this was his trip to Saudi Arabia, uh, with a clear-eyed outlook that the world is not, quote, unquote, a global community, but an arena where nations, non-governmental actors, and businessmen engage and compete for advantage. We bring to this forum unmatched military, political, economic, cultural, and moral strength. And rather than deny this elemental nature of international affairs, we embrace it. In other words, we are in the world as it was imagined by Thomas Hobbes. It's a world of untrammeled competition, of bellum omnium contra omnis, the war of all against each other, and game on. Well, at the macro level, this has meant in foreign policy that even though there have been no true uh, deep crises, uh, there, it has been a year of pretty much ceaseless news. There have been, understandably, a lot of efforts to take stock of what this has meant since we have just rounded uh, the, uh, the one-year point. And you have to admit that this is a fast-moving target. Now, Greg Goss, who many of you will know, as one of the preeminent scholars of this region, wrote last fall that for all the noise, not much had changed in US policy towards the Middle East. Um, but that was written before the administration's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, um, and also before the solidification of the rift in the GCC. I consider myself to be a uh, a great fan of, Craig, of Greg Goss, and I'm betting by now that he has changed his view. My own view is closer to that of Council on Foreign Relations scholar Stuart Patrick, who recently wrote that the, glo the global liberal order has not collapsed, but it is in distress as the president turns his back on the world that the United States made to embrace a nationalist and isolationist foreign policy. And this is very much a consequence of the transactional approach. Now, there is more than a little unpredictability uh, that follows from this approach. But one natural consequence is a strong focus on the power of partners. And Trump personally has an approach that focuses on big states. And that makes sense within this logic. If we're going to compete for advantage, we want to make sure that the big guys are on our side. Now, no one should think that this is completely out of the blue for the United States. America has uh, often wanted to have the strongest players on its side. Before George W. Bush was elected, his advisor and later National Security Advisor and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice criticized the Clinton administration for frittering away energy on small states and regional conflicts. The job of the US, in her view, was to manage relationships with great powers. Uh, but even this is a bit different from what we see today. And President Trump has taken his approach to a much greater extreme. Uh, let me be a little more specific. At a time when the president has pretty consistently denigrated such traditional allies as Germany, in East Asia, we have seen a strengthening or tightening of ties with Japan, which is really the only uh, uh, traditional treaty partner that we have that has come out of the last period well. Uh, and we see this in his, in his uh, relationship with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And to be sure, there is some virtue in this, since it is, comes against the backdrop of the unfolding nuclear uh, confrontation in, uh, in North Korea. India is another case, and the president has forged a close relationship with Narendra Modi. And by the way, being uh, unprecedentedly harsh on Pakistan, which may be something that many other policymakers have at times wanted to do, nonetheless figures into the zero-sum calculus of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, South Asian politics. Although China is viewed by the administration as our chief competitor, 
and has been subjected recently to tariffs as the opening shot in a trade battle, the president still has gone way out of his way uh, to build his relationship with, Pre with President Xi also. Understandable, perhaps, in the context of uh, North Korea. And then, of course, there's Russia. The paradox of our Russian policy has many, many Americans scratching their heads in bewilderment. And the clear intervention of Russia in our elections, their intervention in the elections of others, the uncooperative stance on Syria, which has led to so much human suffering, the continuing presence of Russian troops in Ukraine, the menacing of the Baltic states. Yet President Trump has said nothing critical about Vladimir Putin. Now, interestingly, our government as a whole has taken a much more confrontational stance against Russia. And Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis has identified great power rivalry, translation Russia, as our number one threat. But still, Trump has said nothing of this. We're not even quite sure if he's aware of the Secretary's remarks. In the Middle East, to get to, to, get, to, get to the uh, chase here, uh, this inclination to prefer the big has meant, above all, an embrace of Saudi Arabia and Egypt and a kind of forgetfulness about longtime friends. Now, I wouldn't claim, uh, having been involved in writing two of them, that national security strategy documents are the Rosetta Stone of uh, US foreign policy. But if you look in the recently released uh, strategy on the Middle East section, there is one mention of the GCC, as there was in President Obama's last national security strategy. There is also a single mention of Egypt and of Saudi Arabia. Um, but, and I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to make too much of this. Uh, in the Obama document, there were also mentions of Tunisia and Libya, and those are certainly absent from the current document. What makes Trump's big state focus so problematic is that it comes at a time of uh, the emergence of a newly energized, uh, really unprecedentedly energized, one could say, Saudi leadership with dramatically new policies that are, um, shall we say, forward-leaning at the very least. You all know this very well. We've seen a harder line against Iran, intervention in Yemen, intervention in Lebanese politics, uh, consolidation of power within the country, uh, as well as, to be frank, much, a much-needed reform program at home uh, with uh, Vision 2030. And then finally, there's also been a determination to get the GCC partners to fall in line behind the Saudi lead. Now, one example of how focusing on large states, instead of focusing on the entire picture and on the sort of complex vectors of, of change and force that are passing between different entities, uh, was provided by the administration's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. This was surely a major demonstration of disruption at work. Now, it appears that this move was coordinated to some extent with Saudi Arabia and with Egypt, even if it wasn't necessarily accepted with great enthusiasm. Many smaller states' views were disregarded, including those of Jordan, unquestionably one of America's most important allies in the region, and a country that has, frankly, challenging politics and nothing like the resources it needs uh, to be able to deal with those politics in the way that many other countries in the region do. I recommend to you, by the way, uh, David Ignatius's commentary in today's Washington Post on just how Jordan has been uh, challenged by uh, this impetuous move. In the Gulf, again, and you'll know this better than I do, uh, the intersection of the emphasis on disruption and big states has meant, uh, of course, that the president took his very first trip to abroad to Riyadh, as mentioned before. Uh, this remains, uh, you know, it's happened, so we're used to it, but it remains one of the really shocking things about the uh, administration. Um, and in terms of past practice, as someone who, who um, was very much involved and went to many countries with, uh, the, with President Clinton, I mean, it's really pretty inconceivable. Uh, usually a president would go to Canada or the United Kingdom or another treaty ally um, or to a major summit. Um, 
most of us, when we heard this news, were completely bowled over. Now, Saudi Arabia is a, is a long-term uh, partner. There's no question about it. But uh, this was really out of the ordinary. Um, at that summit, as you all remember, the president met with uh, many regional leaders. And of course, no one will want to forget uh, the image of them having their hands on the glowing orb with uh, King Salman and President al-Sisi, one that will uh, endure through the ages, I'm convinced. At that meeting, uh, the president met with many regional leaders, including Sheikh Tamim. And he said that the United States and Qatar had been, quote, friends for a long time, and that the two leaders discussed uh, the Qatari purchase of, quote, lots of beautiful military equipment. Uh, his spokesman later said that the emir made positive new uh, commitments on counterterrorism finance. By the way, if you haven't seen the news, uh, another um, interesting thing, and this really is off the topic, but the president has told uh, um, the Department of Defense to start planning for a big military parade in Washington. Um, speaking of beautiful military equipment. Um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> shortly after this meeting, uh, and apparently in the belief that they'd been given a green light, the Saudis broke ties with uh, Doha and issued their set of demands and plunged the GCC into crisis. Uh, President Trump famously tweeted support for this move. Uh, I won't reread the tweets, painful enough the first time around. Uh, and that made a bad situation even more volatile. Commentators, uh, certainly in the United States, immediately wondered if the US had suddenly thrown over its relationship with Qatar. And many wondered if the president uh, even knew that he was dealing with the country that hosts the largest US air base in the region and the pivot point for its campaign against Daesh. Now, you who live here, uh, I think, have probably been a little more focused on the policies of Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know that this is not uh, the first rift in the GCC, but it is certainly the worst. And um, <clears throat> you know, it's hard to, without benefit of all the documents and the uh, and the um, memos of conversations and whatnot, know exactly uh, where the which was the chicken and which was the egg. Um, but I think it's safe to say that without both of these parts, without both the um, somewhat adventurous policies of uh, King Salman and, and uh, the Crown Prince Mohammed, uh, and without uh, President Trump's uh, role, this crisis would be hard to imagine. I think it's safe to say that that constellation of events gave us a rather unique outcome. Now, I happened to be speaking with a senior administration official just um, a couple of months ago. And um, uh, I, he was happy to boil down, this was in a conference meeting, um, <clears throat> boil down the new team's um, approach into one sentence. And that was, and they believe that this makes a great contrast to the previous administration. Uh, and he said, look, our, our policy is simple. It's supporting our friends in the region and opposing our foes. Uh, when I pro protested that supporting our friends wasn't, uh, didn't really comprehend all the complexities of uh, the situation, uh, he took great umbrage. Um, <clears throat> but because as we now know, supporting all of our friends, uh, well, it may be a great idea, but all, not all of our th friends think alike or have the same goals, and supporting one against another is clearly a bad idea that can have bad consequences. It's just not that simple. Now, if we fast forward to the president, it's pretty, it's pretty clear that President Trump, uh, if he were a person who regretted things publicly, would admit that he uh, doesn't want to abandon the relationship with Qatar. Um, after the usual confusion of uh, several days, Secretary Tillerson and Secretary of Defense Mattis, someone who I admire greatly, have both worked hard to mend this split. Uh, President Trump himself has been reported to say that he would even mediate. Um, but uh, I think it's safe to say that the energy going into reconciliation uh, hasn't been overwhelming, and regional tensions that were once under control, uh, under control in fact for many years, uh, have now gotten out of hand. Well, per perhaps the US will put the Humpty Dumpty of the GCC back together again, or perhaps with a crisis in North Korea 
and with Washington transfixed by the issue of um, the fact that the Iran nuclear accord is working better than they would like, um, and a State Department that's woefully understaffed, there just won't be the bandwidth to deal with this problem. Um, but even with you know, this backtracking, even with uh, an earnest effort to try to fix the thing, for the US and for the region, the overemphasis on big states uh, is, in my view, the wrong approach. We have long played a steadying hand uh, in the <clears throat> Arabian Gulf region, and that has been beneficial for all, I believe, in terms of maintaining key partnerships that aim at attacking extremism, containing Iran, ensuring the flow of energy, and the like. Uh, and the case at hand just shows how one misstep can have profound effects that will reverberate for quite some time to come. I was just in Kuwait the last few days, and one very thoughtful scholar of the region told me he feared that the GCC might never recover from this episode and that it might indeed fall apart. Uh, and I have to say, I sincerely hope that is not the case. Now, it looks like the commitment to partnerships as such is not what it was, and that rec the recklessness that got us here is what we are all focused on, um, but that does not seem like a, a passing problem. So we have to ask the question, how long is the age of disruption going to last? Well, I am quite sure no one knows. If I had that answer, I'd be a wealthy man at home. Uh, we could have a new president in 2020. We could, you know, depending on what happens with the investigation, have a new president even sooner than that, although he would be one most likely of the same party. <clears throat> and um, it is possible that the next president uh, will be more representative of the roughly two-thirds of the American public that would like to see a return to traditional statecraft and a reassertion of global leadership. We could also face the possibility uh, of a distracted America, inward-looking, uh, and dealing with our own polarization and with our own political warfare. Uh, numerous experts, um, including myself, have said that the single greatest threat the United States faces, not North Korea, not Russia, not Iran for sure, uh, but rather polarization. I think we have to acknowledge the possibility um, that we will not be able to return to things as they were. You do, after all, only step into the same stream once. Uh, <clears throat> although his approval ratings are remarkably lo low, Trump could be reelected, re or someone might replace him who believes, as he does, that the mantle of global leadership is too costly. Trump has, to a remarkable de degree, got the Republican Party wrapped around his finger and has changed the party's orthodoxy. So it's possible that we could have even another minority president uh, with a Trumpian view. Well, one of my goals here today is to underscore the uncertainty in the US relationship with the Gulf region and underscore those costs. And now, just for one moment, I want to set aside the issue of the American president as a cause of the flux that we experience and consider some other factors that are casting a shadow over the future of the relationship. Uh, the first of these is the huge growth uh, in U.S. energy production. I don't have to go through the uh, uh, facts of how fracking technology has allowed the U.S. to recover vast amounts of hydrocarbons that had been out of reach before and how that has made us the world's top producer of oil and natural gas. But the foreign policy consequences of that are um, astonishingly, really, in, uh, in um, the U.S. policy context seldom discussed. If you ask a member of the US foreign policy, uh, foreign policy establishment, the reflexive uh, r response that you will get is that because of the continued centrality to energy markets, the Gulf will always be a vital interest of the United States, even if the US consumes a negligible amount uh, or no Gulf oil or gas. And some experts go even further. Megan O'Sullivan, who was a deputy national security advisor in the Bush administration, contends that the Gulf's uh, geopolitical importance is going to grow because in an era of cheap energy, uh, there's a premium on, uh, on production uh, in a place where energy can be recovered most inexpensively, and that place remains the Gulf. 
But I really think we need a note of caution here. Um, we need to be careful about overrating the importance of the foreign policy uh, establishment and underrating the importance of American presidents and the US Congress, which as, have we, which as we have seen have become fairly unpredictable. The prospect of savings from reduced engagement in the Gulf region could prove very attractive uh, to one or both of those entities. And it pains me to say it, but we also need to reckon with the possibility that future American leaders will not be as wedded to an America that guarantees the global order as our leaders have in the past. So there's one other thing that hangs over this picture, and that is uh, US macroeconomics, something that I confess my understanding of is really thin. Uh, but I get this. Um, the US economy is humming. Uh, but the impact of the recently passed $1.5 trillion tax cut on top of uh, the continuing financial obligations from the past we have is going to curtail our abilities. Currently, it looks like the U.S. will fund any amount of defense spending. Uh, we're talking about nearly, uh, a nearly $2 trillion renovation of our nuclear arsenal. Um, but there was once a great economist, um, luckily he... He's famous not for numbers, but for some of his remarks. Um, who, uh, his name was Herbert Stein. He was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. And he once said, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. And that has become known as Stein's Law. And the US debt has grown uh, remarkably since uh, we paid for Iraq on a credit card. And since we had to spend very large sums to uh, get ourselves out of the financial crisis. We have a really serious federal debt problem. And as a senior RAND economist has pointed out, after 2039, all things being equal and proceeding on the trajectory they are, the government will need to borrow if it wants to spend a penny on environmental protection, education, transportation, veterans' benefits and services, the administration of justice, diplomacy, and defense. OK, so the title of my talk in, uh, suggested that I had some ideas um, for dealing with this season of disruption. I don't really want to oversell them. Um, but here they are. First, one reason not to panic. Um, you have friends in the national security establishment uh, inside the government. The career people uh, get it. They understand these relationships, and they're going to work their level best as long as they can to mitigate any excesses uh, emanating from the White House. They value the relationships throughout the Gulf, and uh, I think that they will, um, they will stick to the course. We're in a very strange position right now. We basically have four branches of government. Um, you know the judicial and Congress. We also have President Trump and the rest of the executive, and they are just often at odds. Um, <clears throat> One of the key questions will just be how long the bureaucracy uh, can keep uh, juggling. There are also real reasons why we should stay, uh, why, this, uh, why this partnership should hold together, and that is we have common, significant common interests that matter a lot to the president, above all counterterrorism and containing Iran. Uh, regional powers should not be shy about underscoring those common interests, and none of these goals really none of them can be achieved if the alliances involved crumble. At the same time, we need to all be very careful not to contribute to the escalation of tensions with Iran. And for my money, we are way too close to a clash uh, in this area. And I don't think that such a clash will serve anyone's interests. Um, <clears throat> now, some newer ideas. It's time for, I think, a some innovative approaches to our relationships. In particular, it seems to me to be time for more engagement by Gulf countries uh, with the US, uh, especially in civil society, which is one reason why it's really great to be in uh, a US guttery, uh, guttery uh, university. Uh, there needs to be stronger ties between uh, our universities uh, our think tanks, our medical schools, our environmental scientists, our writers, our artists, and the list goes on. 
The US public doesn't know as, as much as it needs to about the Gulf, and it won't happen without a gentle push. <clears throat> in, post -World War II, in the post-World War II period, um, under very different circumstances, this kind of engagement worked very, very well uh, for Germany and Japan, and I believe it can work well here too. Relatedly, we need to speak more um, about our economic ties, which are broad and deep. The Gulf is not just any part of the world. It is, in a sense, the center of global financial liquidity, and that is a big deal. Um, <clears throat> we saw this during the financial crisis when Gulf countries together took on the role as a kind of guarantor of the global economy, and that was a very successful undertaking. Too many Americans are unaware of this, uh, even if uh, the financial community uh, does know about it. Well, let me just say in closing, and I'm open to more ideas, and I hope some will come out in the Q&A, but let me just say in closing that it's fitting to be talking about um, these challenges in the Gulf uh, because it was here, admittedly, um, a little bit up the waterway in 1990 and 1991 that the U.S. under George Herbert Walker Bush gave one of America's de best demonstrations of its commitment to our historic values, to our belief in international law, and a non-anarchic vision of the world that involved taking seriously our relationships with countries big and small, uh, that respected their rights and sovereignty, and that, worked, uh, and, and that worked to enforce a liberal global order that really has benefited, benefited us all. And I truly hope that that America will soon be in evidence again. I want to thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your questions.